Welcome to the Friends of Malheur National Wildlife Refuge's first ever virtual Friends Gathering. This afternoon's presentation is Principles and Pitfalls of Bird Identification with Ken Kaufman. This is just one of many online programs taking place this week during our virtual Friends Gathering. And I'll tell you more about what else we have coming up later on after we're wrapping up. But who am I? I'm Janelle Wicks. I'm the Executive Director of the Friends of Malheur National Wildlife Refuge, and I'm really excited to be bringing all these programs to you throughout the week. Um, in October, I'll have been in this role for two years. So um, it's been a lot of fun in the last two years to have gone through a government shutdown last January and now a pandemic. Um, and it's been interesting along the way to see the strength of this community as we learn and adapt and grow and connect in order to support the refuge through our friends group. So thank you for being a part of this community. This year in particular, 2020, has presented its challenges to making our objective as an organization um, a little bit challenging. Um, but we have these great tools like Zoom to bring you virtual presentations. And today we have Ken Kaufman to to talk to us about bird identification. So with that, I'm going to just turn it over to Ken and let him tell you more about himself and give his presentation. Thank you, Ken. Okay, well, thanks, Janelle. Um, Ken, uh, am I coming through okay in terms of sound? Sounds great. Okay, thanks, and you, you sounded great too. Uh, well, <laughs> I'm really happy to be here. Um, I uh, really, um, really proud to be involved with the Friends of Malheur Refuge, uh, a wonderful refuge and a, a wonderful friends group that does a lot to support this iconic place. Um, so, yeah, I, I really appreciate the invitation to take part in this this virtual friends gathering, and I'm going to be talking about um, about bird identification stuff and. Uh, I always uh, I always like to start off by saying that um, even though I'm really focused on identifying birds, I recognize that it's it's just one part of appreciating birds. And certainly, you could appreciate the beauty of some bird without knowing what its name is. I mean, the name is just a, a you know a temporary label that humans have put on it. And we could you know look at this this bird flying around flying around over the water and just appreciate how graceful it is without ever putting any kind of name on it. But if you, if you know that it's a turn, then you can find out more about the turns and the lives that they lead. And if you go farther and say, well, this is a common turn, then you can find out how that differs from others like the Forster's turn and the Arctic turn in terms of their, their migration and where they go. So um, I just think that um, being able to identify things uh, it gives us the a window into knowing more about them, and so I think it makes nature even more fascinating. So, um, if if I seem to spend a lot of time on identification, it's not because I think that's the only important subject. It's just a, a great entryway. Um, and I'm going to be asking Janelle to advance the slides because uh, uh, not trusting the connection completely, I just sent her the uh, the PowerPoint so she can forward it uh, from there rather than me trying to do it from Oak Harbor, Ohio. So uh, Janelle, if you could go to the next slide, please. There it is. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> there's a there's a baby robin just out of the nest, um, and some of the stuff I'm going to be talking about could be considered to be sort of uh, the basics, but I I don't uh, I'm not like assuming that everyone is a beginner or trying to talk down to you or anything, just something to think about is that um, we don't necessarily learn the basics when we start um, birding. I mean, I got into birding as a six-year-old and there were some sort of basic things that I didn't understand. I didn't understand until, you know, 10 or 15 years later. So the way we learn to recognize birds is sort of like the way a baby learns language, like, you know, a baby human um, doesn't begin by learning the difference between nouns and verbs and then 
diagramming sentences and things. All right, you know, the baby learns a few words that get a reaction from the adults around and then gradually learns how to string those words together into sentences. And things like rules of grammar and rules of spelling, um, that person doesn't learn until years later. And, and it's that way with, with identifying birds too. So I think even, even if we've been in it for years, it, uh, it doesn't hurt to uh, go back and review some of these things. So I'm gonna go through uh, like 12 uh, basic points uh, to talk about today. Uh, so next, uh, please. Okay, the, um, the first point I like to make is that the, uh, we should think about understanding what we're seeing and hearing and not just putting a name on things. Um, and think of it as sort of a spectrum of understanding. Uh, it's so tempting to, to go out when you see a bird and say, okay, that's a such and such, you know, that's an American avocet, and then go on to the next bird. But, you know, you, by spending more time with it, you can sometimes uh, take it farther than that. Um, so uh, next slide, please. So for example, um, here's a, a bay-breasted warbler. Now this is, this is a rare bird in the West. It, it has been found uh, a number of times at the, uh, the trees around the headquarters at the Mount Here Refuge. It's a you know, really exciting find when you find this, this Eastern bird there. Um, but if you were someplace where it's really common, like where I live in Ohio, um, you know, you might see this on a spring morning and just say bay-breasted warbler and go on and, you know, say, okay, well, I've identified it and leave it at that. But you can, you can actually take it farther than that. You can look at this bird and say, okay, it's a bay-breasted warbler and it's also a male because the females are never as brightly colored as this. Uh, it's a male in uh, its uh, breeding plumage in spring or summer because during the fall and winter, it's in a much uh, duller plumage than this. And it's not a full adult. It's like a one-year-old male bay-breasted warbler because if it were a full adult, the face would be black instead of gray and the, the chestnut on the sides would go down farther. So you can take it way beyond uh, just putting a species name on it. Uh, next, please. Now, on, on the other hand, <laughs> this uh, uh, I photographed this bird, um, this gull. Um, and I spent about 20 minutes studying it, but I still don't know what species it was, and I never will. Um, but I don't, um, I don't necessarily regard that as a failure. It's more like um, I can tell you why I don't know what it was. Uh, this was on the Texas coast. It was in an area where it would be possible to find hybrids between the herring gull and the kelp gull. Um, or it could be a hybrid between herring gull and something else. So, and it's a one-year-old bird uh, in very worn plumage. So all the wing feathers are practically worn away to nothing. So, you know, I can't tell you what species it is, but I can tell you why I don't know. And that's, that's sort of a victory too. If you can look at a bird and say, um, I don't know what it is. And the reason I don't know is because of this, then it, you know, it means you made progress. So, there, there's this whole spectrum between not being able to put a name, not being able to put a name on it at all and being able to go way beyond the species. So anyway, the, uh, just, just think of it as a, a spectrum and think about understanding uh, what we're seeing and hearing. Uh, next, please. Okay, this I think is, um, uh, it's good to focus on learning the common birds. And uh, I, when I got started as a kid, I really wanted to find rare birds. And so I went out and I found rare birds all over the place. I mean, everything I looked at was rare uh, because I, I was just jumping to conclusions about them. But um, the best way to really find rare birds is to get to know the common birds just as well as we can. Uh, next, please. Uh, so for example, um, the house finch is a bird that's really common across North America. And so uh, as a result, uh, it's a fair percentage of the birds you're going to see uh, will be house finches. And the better we know them in all their variations, uh, the less likely we are uh, to get tripped up by them. Uh, next, please. There are you know, some really common birds like the, uh, uh, the female house sparrow or the female red-winged blackbird. 
Uh, if you see them out of um, out of the usual context, uh, they can be confusing. You know, if you see a house sparrow more than a hundred yards from a building, uh, or if you see a red winged red -winged blackbird away from the marsh, it can be like, wait, what's this? And so, the more time we spend studying these, it might seem like a waste of time when you're birding to really sit and look at house sparrows, but it, it's worth doing, worth building up your familiarity with every common bird just as much as you can. Uh, it will pay off later in, in being able to pick out different things. Uh, next, please. And another thing that happens is that uh, if you travel, you know, <laughs> back in the days when we used to be able to travel, um, some birds uh, vary from place to place. So uh, song sparrows, um, they look really different on the Pacific Northwest coast than they do in the desert southwest or on the east coast. And um, so you study them, if you really get to know them extremely well in one area, then when you travel to another area, even if the song sparrows start to look different there, you can think, you know, I think that might be. So um, it's um, uh, just, just, there's just great value to, to getting to know those common birds. So if you're out for a day of birding and you don't see anything rare or unusual or new, uh, it doesn't mean that it's, um, that there's anything wasted about it because, you know, even the most common bird is beautiful. And the more you study them, the better you'll be able to recognize them uh, uh, later on. Uh, let's see, next please. Okay, I always um, I always say that the shape of each bird is the uh, is the most important thing about it. Um, behavior, the surroundings, and habitat are really important too. But you know, rather than starting with something like color, uh, if you start with the shape of the bird, uh, it really helps to uh, to get you off on the right track. Uh, next, please. And this is um, I'll be talking about this more. Um, when I'm talking about shorebirds uh, in a couple of days, but with with the shorebirds, uh, a lot of the sandpipers, um, the in terms of color pattern, they all look the same. They're they're brown or gray above and whitish underneath, but they have different shapes. And here we've got um, a, a pectoral sandpiper is that sort of stocky bird on the left, and a lesser yellow legs is the more slender, long legged bird on the right. And you know, you can see in terms of color pattern, they're uh, pretty much the same, and they're even standing in the same posture. Um, next, please. But their shapes are so different um, that we really don't have to worry about the fact that their colors look just about the same. Um, just, just in terms of silhouette, uh, they, they immediately stand out as being different. Uh, next, please. Now, one problem with that is that, you know, birds are, you know, it's not like a seashell. It's going to be the same shape all the time. You know, birds, they've got muscles and bones and things in there, and they move around into different positions, and they've got feathers that can fluff out. Um, so their their appearance of shape can seem to change all the time. So, you know, this, this whimbrel, um, you know, they, as it moves around, um, gets into different postures, walks or rests or whatever, uh, its overall shape is going to seem to change from minute to minute. So to really get to know the shapes of these birds, um, you can either study lots and lots of photographs, or you can just spend more time watching the bird out in the wild, um, watching to see how its overall shape changes um, as it moves around. Uh, next, please. And of course, the um, with a bird that's flying, um, it's, its shape is going to change constantly. And uh, uh, you can practice on, on common ravens, for example, like this one. Uh, these, these are three photos of the same bird uh, flying around. And I guess it, it dropped that uh, hamburger bun or whatever it was carrying um, <laughs> for one of the pictures. But you can see it, as it flies, the, the shape of the wingtips, they seem to be narrowed in or spread out and the tail can be narrow or wide. Uh, as it moves those feathers around. So again, uh, just, just spending more time watching them um, helps you to uh, memorize the, the limits of how much, uh, uh, how much the apparent shape can seem to change. Uh, let's see, next please. 
Um, yeah, let's think about the the natural groupings of birds, about the way uh, the way birds are classified. Um, you know, scientists they're we're still <laughs> after centuries still groping toward a real classification of birds and figuring out what's related. But uh, we've got pretty good ideas of it now, and and being able to place a bird into a group will take you a long way um, toward identifying it. Um, next, please. Uh, so, for example, uh, looking at this, um, you know, we might not immediately know what species this is, um, but I think most of us would guess immediately that it's a hummingbird because it's got a long, thin bill. It's got very long wings that come practically to the end of the tail, and it's sitting on a hummingbird feeder. <laughs> so that's another clue, too. Um, it's actually a, a buff-tailed coronet from South America. But, you know, just just knowing, looking at it and immediately knowing that it's a hummingbird, that narrows it down to, you know, only about 350 species in the world rather than close to 11,000. So being able to put it in the family is really helpful. Uh, but you can go beyond that within the families uh, to look at groupings. Uh, uh, let's see, next slide, please. So, for example, um, in some cases, looking at their names uh, can help uh, put them in groups, but their their English names don't uh, don't necessarily help that much. Uh, you can look at these: um, ringneck duck, model duck, mallard. Ringneck ducks and mallards uh, you can find regularly uh, throughout the Pacific Northwest. Model duck, not so much. And if you were just looking at the English name, you might expect the model duck to look more like the ringneck duck. Uh, next, please. But if you look at the uh, scientific names, uh, the first part of the scientific name is the, uh, the genus that it's in. Uh, next, please. So here the, uh, the genus is what's highlighted there. So the, the ringneck duck is in the ge genus Athia. Uh, model duck and mallard are both in the genus Anas. And so those two are actually close relatives, and the, the ringneck duck is, is quite different. And um, let's see, next slide, please. So, yeah, here they are uh, demonstrating the, uh, the ringneck duck at the top, and then model duck in the center, and mallard at the bottom. And the, the ringneck duck is one of the diving ducks, and so it's got. Um, it's got a shorter body, it's shorter bodied, heavier, can dive underwater more easily. Uh, in flight, it's gonna have faster wing beats uh, relative to its size because all the diving ducks uh, have much faster wing beats. And here you can see they even swim in different directions. The, uh, the dabbling ducks are swimming toward the left and the rainneck duck is uh, swimming toward the right. And you, you can't always rely on that, but anyway, the. Um, you can see the overall appearance there is quite similar between the, the model duck and the female mallard. And if you were looking at that part of the scientific name, you would expect that to be the case. And you can apply that to all kinds of other families of birds. Now, looking at sparrows, um, the sparrows that are in the genus Zonotrichia, like the white-crowned and golden-crowned and white-throated, are going to have a lot of things in common in terms of their, their behavior and habitat choice and, and voices and things. And so thinking about the genus, looking at the scientific name, see which birds are classified uh, together, uh, helps you prepare for uh, knowing uh, which birds are, are going to have these characteristics in common. Let's see, uh, next slide, please. Okay, this, um, this might seem kind of weird, um, saying get to know the fluidity of a bird's coat of feathers. Uh, in other words, think about um, the, you know, the, the birds are covered with feathers and it's a good thing for us that they are because they don't look all that good without them. Uh, and, but as the bird moves around, those feathers, they're just attached at one end and then they lie loose. And so the apparent pattern uh, can seem to change uh, depending on, um, on, on how the bird, um, how the bird moves around. Uh, next slide, please. So for example, um, 
yeah, we can look at the, the red winged blackbird. That's one of our great marsh birds. And you can see, even though it's called, called red winged blackbird, the red is just a, a small part of the wing. It's just up on feathers that we call, <clears throat> that we call the lesser coverts. And then the median coverts are yellow, and then the greater coverts are black, and the rest of the wing is black. And um, the, uh, the obviousness, the conspicuousness of that red changes a lot. Uh, depending on what position uh, the bird is in. Uh, next, please. Um, so, uh, for example, uh, often when a male red-winged blackbird is walking around, you just see this little sliver of red and yellow, and sometimes it's just a very narrow line of yellow that's visible. You know, when I was seven years old and saw my first red-winged blackbirds, they were walking around on the black on the ground, and they were blackbirds with a tiny bit of yellowish white on the wing and I could not figure them out until they, they finally flew. Um, so sometimes that red is almost invisible. Sometimes it's obvious. When the males are singing, they sort of spread their wings out and puff up those shoulder feathers and it just really shines out like a beacon. They can really make it obvious. And this happens with, uh, with a lot of things uh, in terms of wing pattern. Uh, next, please. So for example, uh, looking at this, this female northern shoveler, um, if the wing is spread on a northern shoveler, you can see that like a quarter of the upper surface is pale blue. It's, it's a really obvious uh, blue area like what you see on a cinnamon teal or blue winged teal. Uh, but when the bird is swimming, that, that pale color um, is completely hidden because the wing is tucked in um, it's tucked in with the, the scapular feathers coming down from below and the body feathers coming up. Um, uh, let's see. Let's, uh, yeah, let's see if I can point this out. The, uh, the flank feathers coming up from below and the scapular feathers coming down from above. Uh, and so most of the wing is, is hidden. And it's only back here uh, toward the wingtips that you actually see uh, part, of the, part of the wing showing up. And so that's, that's just something to be aware of. Uh, a bird can have a really major obvious wing pattern, but it might be completely hidden uh, when the bird isn't flying, just depending on the posture that it's in. Uh, next, please. And tail pattern is another thing that can seem to change from, from minute to minute. Um, here, this is a diagram of the, the bird's tail uh, as viewed from the upper side. And, uh, except that they usually don't have the little numbers and labels on them. Um, and the, the important thing, and I was watching birds for years before I understood this, but the, when the tail is completely folded up, the central feathers are on the top and the outer feathers are on the bottom underneath. So depending on whether you're seeing the bird uh, from, like from the back or above the tail or from the front, like below the tail, the, the color of the tail can seem to change a lot. Uh, next, please. So here's a couple of different views of the, um, the eastern form of the yellow rumped warbler. Um, I know you, you get a few of those around. Um, uh, they're, they're more common in the east, but you see more of the Audubon's type yellow rumped warblers there uh, around the refuge. Um, but here, um, the, uh, the yellow rumped warbler has a lot of white in the outermost tail feathers. So on the upper picture there, you're looking up at the bird, you're just seeing basically the two outermost feathers of the tail. So the tail, the, the tail looks mostly white. Now in the lower, lower picture, you're seeing the tail from the upper side. So you're mostly just seeing like the central feathers and those feathers are completely dark. So looking at it from the back there, the, the tail looks, um, you know, looks completely dark gray. Now, if the bird flies and spreads the tail out, you'll see those white spots flash out in the, in the outer feathers. But um, tail pattern, you know, bef before we come to a firm conclusion about the tail pattern uh, on a bird, um, it's really good to think about what angle am I looking from? Am I seeing the upper side of the tail or the underside? Or, you know, is it maybe molting and missing some of the tail feathers altogether? So um, a lot to think about there, but it, it has an impact on, on what we see when we look at these birds.
Uh, next, please. Okay, this is, um, yeah, another thing about feathers. Consider the condition of the bird's plumage. Um, you know, again, these, these birds, they're covered with feathers, and feathers are really wonderful structures. They're strong and lightweight, but they, they do wear out. So um, feathers, um, when they're really fresh, they may look uh, crisp and beautiful. And after the bird has been wear, wearing those same feathers for many months, they start to get more worn. They may be fade, faded in color uh, and not look so good. Uh, next, please. So for example, this is a ring-billed gull in September. And this is, uh, this is a bird that just hatched uh, two or three months earlier. It's still mostly in its juvenile plumage. So um, uh, if you look at the wing, most of those feathers are brown with pale edges, little pale notches uh, along the edge. And they've, they've got a really strong pattern. Uh, up on the back, some of those feathers are starting to be replaced by the gray feathers it'll have in its first winter plumage. But back on the wing tip, there are little white crescents at the tip. Uh, of each of the primary feathers. It looks really nice and fresh. Uh, next. Uh, now this could be the very same bird um, about nine months later. And it's, um, the back just looks gray now because it's molted in gray feathers, but all those wing feathers that just look white and ragged there now, they haven't molted. Those are still those same feathers that were brown uh, with pale edges, but now they've faded out to white and they really look terrible. If you look back at the wingtip there, uh, the, those feathers are now faded to brown. They look all ratty. Uh, this bird really needs to molt soon. Uh, next, please. So here, you, know, this, you can see this bird, it's, it's missing some feathers, and uh, uh, this is, uh, it really needs to replace those feathers, and it will uh, pretty soon. Um, these, every bird, um, Especially if you're talking about smaller birds, it's safe to say that every wild bird will replace um, all of its feathers at least once a year. But that doesn't hold up when you get to big birds like uh, like eagles. That may it may take them several years to go through this orderly process of replacing all the wing feathers. But um, overall, we can expect birds to replace their feathers uh, once a year. And so when they're when they're molting, uh, they can look really strange. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so here's, uh, these are three uh, young ring-billed gulls uh, in October and November. These are all just a few months old. And if you look at the pattern of the back and wings on these, they're, they all look different just because they're, um, they're not molting at exactly the same rate. Um, they're, um, they're showing different amounts of wear on those feathers. And so uh, that can be tricky. Uh, next slide, please. And here's, uh, this is a Bonaparte's gull in September, and you can look at that, that weird wing shape with one really long outer feather there. That's just because that's an old feather that hasn't been replaced yet. And on that upper wing, the one that's toward us, you can see how there are new feathers growing in. And this, uh, this time coming up now, um, you know, August and September is a really good time to go out and look at birds. And if you see gulls flying around, a lot of them will have really strange patterns and strange wing shapes as they uh, replace those feathers. And if we, you know, pay attention to that now, we can see what's happening. And so it won't, um, it won't be tricky, just, just being aware of what's going on. Uh, let's see. Okay, uh, next, please. Now this, uh, this sort of ties into what I was saying about birds molting at different rates. We can expect to see variation and no two individual birds look exactly alike. And that, that might seem hard to, hard to believe, but it, it's actually true if you, if you look closely enough. Uh, next, please. So for example, um, if you find a, uh, you know, a flock of snow geese and start looking through, um, there'll be some differences there, partly because you know, there'll be a few Ross's geese mixed into the flock, but then there'll be some adults and immatures. And if you start looking really closely, you'll see little differences among all of them. And this happens, you, you can practice on any kind of bird that gathers in flocks. So, you know, blackbirds or starlings, if you look through, uh, no two of them will look exactly the same. And so that variation is really, um, uh, really valuable to, to study because at a certain point, 
um, in variation in snow goose. It's so different that it's actually a Ross's goose instead. So if we if we study these birds enough to see what their normal variation is, uh, then we can we'll have a better idea of when we see something that's that's so different that it has to be a different species. Uh, next, please. And here's an example um, again with birds molting at different um, different rates. These are sanderlings. They're all adult sanderlings. They were all photographed in early May. But the one on the left is all the way into full breeding plumage, which they don't wear for very long. And the other two are not nearly as far along, so they look much paler. Um, just, you know, we can expect to see that kind of variation within flocks of almost any kind of bird. Uh, next, please. Okay, this is, this is kind of a fun one. Um, be alert to your illusions. Um, there are there are all kinds of uh, uh, tricky illusions out there, uh, visual illusions that we get when we look at birds, and uh, things that can trip us on, up. Um, let's see, next please. Uh, one of them involves the the size of a bird. Um, if you go out to the coast and you see a, a black guillemot or a pigeon guillemot for the first time and it's this bird just floating out on the water all by itself with nothing around for reference you might think okay well is this like is this bird the size of a mallard or is it the size of a canada goose or but if you actually were close enough to have it in comparison to something like your hand you'd realize it's much smaller than that um, but without something nearby when you see an unfamiliar bird uh, it can be really tricky to guess um, what size it is. And I I know um, I used to have trouble when I was first learning the birds, I would see something and I'd say, well, that, you know, it looks like a towhee, but it's much too large. And, you know, I'd finally figure out, okay, it's a towhee and I'm just wrong about uh, what size it is. And it's, um, you know, it's surprisingly easy to get off on the wrong foot about the size of a bird. Uh, next, please. And uh, uh, colors, um, you know, birds are affected by uh, their surroundings with light being reflected onto them. Um, I lived in the Southwest for many years and then moved to Ohio. And the first winter that I was here, I was driving along the road and saw this brilliant white bird flying overhead. And I thought, wow, it's gotta be a white deer falcon or something. I jumped out of the car, looked in, uh, it was a red-tailed hawk but there was snow on the ground and light was reflecting up on this hawk and so it just looked brilliant white and i um you know that kind of thing happens you'll see a bird fly into a bush and you got to look at it and it looks green because there's light reflecting onto it from the leaves and uh, just it, it's always helpful to sort of step back and say you know am i getting some false impression of the colors of this bird uh, let's see next please and we also have to be alert to things that are not illusions, but things that are weird about the birds themselves when they're trying to trick us. Um, next, please. Uh, for example, um, a lot of places in field guides, they'll talk about the bill shape on a bird. Um, but birds do get sort of bill deformities at times. And as long as they can still feed themselves, um, they can survive perfectly fine that way. Um, sometimes for years. Uh, this is a northern water thrush that was captured at a banding station. Um, it did have a body and stuff. I just edited that out. But um, but its bill was crossed. And uh, the first thought was like, what, is this a cross bill or something? But it was just uh, a northern water thrush that was normal in every other way, except that uh, it had this bill deformity. Uh, next, please. Uh, at the same banding station, um, they captured this completely white bird that with the, they took enough measurements to figure out that it was a Swainson's thrush. Um, but that would have been a really tough thing to identify in the field unless it were calling or something because, you know, it's close to the same shape as, as other thrushes and, you know, no, no field marks there. You can't rely on the, uh, the pale eye ring, for example. Uh, next, please. And this um, 
a, a bird with white in its plumage, it's not necessarily an albino, it may be leukistic, and partial leukism can produce some really odd birds, like uh, this turkey vulture that was hanging around in southern Ohio for a couple of years. Uh, the flight feathers on one wing were leukistic, and so it looked really strange. And uh, one thing you can see there is that the leukistic feathers are not as strong as the normal ones, and they wear away more rapidly, and so that side of the bird, um, uh, the, the wing feathers looked much more ragged. So there, there are problems for the bird if it's got that, uh, that kind of uh, odd coloring, but again, some of them live a long time that way. Uh, next, please. Now, the opposite of that leukism is something called uh, melanism, where the bird is unusually dark. And uh, for example, this white-throated sparrow, when we first saw it, um, we thought it might be uh, like a hybrid uh, between a white-throated sparrow and a, a dark-eyed junco, because that happens. But it was perfectly normal uh, shape and size and behavior and call notes for a white-throated sparrow, and it just had way more melanin uh, in the pigment of the feathers than the ordinary uh, individual. So really a, a fascinating, uh, fascinating thing to see. Um, uh, let's see, okay. uh, next please. Okay, um, now behavior is really important too, and this, um, I'm not going to go into much detail about this because, um, you know, anything about behavior or the way the bird forages and so on is, is really helpful, but one part of that that's useful uh, uh, is the, um, it's social behavior, like whether it's with other birds or uh, more solitary. Uh, next, please. You know, so for example, some birds really like to be in flocks, and uh, if you go to a place where marble godwits are common, uh, you'll find that they're flocking together. They're not just scattered out as individuals. They, uh, they flock together and they enjoy each other's company. Um, next, please. And you see that within families, there's some, uh, some real differences. Um, looking at uh, a couple of common species of sparrows, for example, a golden golden crown sparrows uh, they show up uh, to spend the winter um, they're usually in flocks you find flocks of them they may be mixed with white crown sparrows or mixed in with some white-throated sparrows or maybe with some juncos but they're very sociable birds and so if you find golden crown sparrows if you find multiples they'll be together uh, but lincoln sparrow is more of a solitary bird so even if there are a lot of lincoln sparrows around you won't find them in a flock. They're more likely to be just scattered out as, as separate individuals. And that, that kind of, uh, you know, being familiar with that, uh, that social behavior really, um, uh, it can really help when you get your first glimpse of a sparrow to think about, okay, is it just by itself or is it in with a flock of others? Um, and that kind of thing applies to birds in, in various other groups too. Uh, okay, uh, next please. And um, this is one of the uh, one of the most important things, and it was one of the hardest things for me to learn, uh, is just to learn how to say I don't know, because sometimes that's the correct answer. Uh, sometimes, you know, we just don't see the bird well enough, um, and you know, it's it's always tempting to guess, and it's you know, it's fine to guess and say I think it was this, but. Yeah, you know, when you come to the end of the day, when you're putting that thing down on your list, you'll feel a lot better about it if you just admit and say, well, I'm not really sure um, that that was uh, a deer falcon or that was a Ross's gull. I'm not totally sure. Um, so I'll put it down as possible. Um, and, um, you know, it's much, it's more educational too. We, we can learn more if we admit that we don't, uh, that we don't know what something is. Um, that you know, that gives us the incentive to go on and, and research more about it, and say, okay, um, these are these are things I should look for the next time I run across a bird that might be this. And so, uh, you know, the the greatest uh, the greatest bird experts I've ever met uh, would admit at times that they they just didn't know that you know, I'm not sure what that is. So it's, it's a great skill to have. 
Uh, let's see. Okay, next, please. Now, finally, the single best way to improve our, our skills at bird identification is just to spend more time with individual birds, just looking and listening. Um, see, next, please. Uh, so, for example, um, you know, we're out to, you know, find a warbling vireo, and often warbling vireos will just sing on and on, and it's, uh, you know, so it's, it's great. They make great background music, but it's also worthwhile to go look at that bird, and, you know, it's, it's pretty plain, but it does have a distinctive face pattern, and, you know, it's got a distinctive song. You can listen to it and sort of take a careful note, and that way, you know, if you travel east, you'll notice that warbling vireos in the east sound a little bit different from those in the west, and they may be a different species. And, you know, if you've paid close enough attention, then as soon as they split those, you can check them off. Um, but just, just spending more time um, just studying. And this is, you know, especially, um, especially if you're relatively new to birding and you go on a field trip, um, often you know, everyone in the group will be looking at some bird and focusing at it until the leader says what it is, and then everyone lowers the binoculars and looks around for something else. But when you've just found out what something is, you know, that's the uh, the perfect time uh, to really focus uh, and spend more time. Say, okay, well, this is a warbling vireo. I'd better spend another minute uh, looking at it. Uh, next, please. Or something like a, a northern harrier flying around, and northern harriers flying low over the field, and you see that that white rump, and so on, and so you uh, you can identify it that way. But if you spend another few minutes and watch it flying around, maybe it'll get up overhead, and you'll get to study what it looks like uh, from that angle too. And so, on just the you know, if I were giving one piece of advice, that would be it. It would be to spend spend more time. Uh, with individual birds, just just watching them and listening to them, and you know, birds are they're beautiful. They look beautiful. They sound beautiful. So this is not a rough assignment to have. It's uh, you know, just spend a little bit more time appreciating that individual bird, and you'll also learn more uh, and be better prepared to identify it the next time. Uh, next slide, please. So. That, that's sort of the, the takeaway is that the, uh, the overall goal is not just to put a name on that bird, but to have a greater awareness of it. And uh, I think that leads to greater appreciation and greater knowledge as well. So I'm, I'm going to stop at that point and see if, um, because that's the end, <laughs> and see if we have uh, any questions. We do, Ken. Um, so if okay. you have questions, go ahead and put them in the chat box. I will moderate it from here. Um, Linda Neal has asked if you could describe or explain um, leucism in birds. Okay, right. Yeah. Um, well, for one thing, leucism is a, is a great way to get arguments started because about 50% of the birding population uh, pronounces it as leucism and the rest as leucism. So <laughs> that's if you want to get things going uh, bring that up but basically it's a, a lack of um, pigment uh, in the feathers and there are a couple of different definitions sometimes it's just referred to it just refers to a lack of the melanin <clears throat> the melanin pigments which uh, melanin produces the black and gray and some of the browns um, in in the in the feathers and uh, even some of the reddish browns where yellow and red and orange are produced by other kinds of, of pigments. And so well, you can have a leucistic bird that um, like a, uh, uh, say a, a house finch where all the brown is missing, but the red areas are still there. And you could say that's, that's leucistic or leucistic. Um, but that's, um, uh, if, and if a bird is, 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 has that uh, condition in an extreme way, it's going to look uh, mostly white, um, but it's not, uh, it's not an actual albino unless it's actually missing uh, completely all of the pigments uh, from every part of its uh, uh, plumage and skin and body. 
Thank you. Some people in this region may be familiar with Blondie, the bald eagle uh, down in the Klamath Basin region um, that has leucism. And there's also in the Klamath Basin refuges in the last few years, a couple sequential years, a sandhill crane with leucism has been showing up. Um, okay. So yeah, keep your eyes peeled um, for that. Okay. So do bird guidebooks have different philosophies on what is essential in identification? Um, yeah, there's, um, well, I, I, yeah, every, I think every, um, every field guide has a, uh, a, a slightly different philosophy and approach. And that's one reason why it's good to, uh, to have multiples. I mean, I, I buy every field guide that comes out. Um, and some of them are more geared toward um, toward beginners or toward making the first steps as easy as possible. And so, you know, for example, my my field guide to, to birds is 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 aimed more at uh, at the first step. And then there are others like the National Geographic field guide that sort of assumes that people using it already have a certain amount of knowledge. Uh, and so it goes more to the detailed questions. Um, but yeah, I think. Um, I think anyone who's studied bird identification for a long time probably has a general agreement about the kinds of things that are important, but we'll have different opinions uh, as to which are which are most important. Um, so, um, so, so yeah, and that that's again that's that's one reason why it's good to buy multiple field guides and and read the introductory material because often. Uh, in that introduction that no one ever reads, uh, often there's some real gems in there. Yeah, especially if you're a new birder, you want the intro to have um, body part descriptions, you want the um, sections of, of different bird groups to have silhouette pages, um, in-flight pages for hawks are really helpful, um, raptors, so yeah, it's really diving into the differences in field guide books is, is helpful. Um, and having a few is not a bad thing. Um, okay, so we have a question about McGee Marsh. When is the best time in the fall to visit McGee Marsh? That is, do the warblers come through there in the fall as well as the spring? Okay, thank you. Yeah, McGee Marsh, Ohio, which is like seven miles from where I'm sitting right now. Um, it's, it's famous for the warbler migration in spring. Uh, they do come through in fall as well. They're not as easy to see then because uh, their, their fall migration is relatively early. Uh, they, they're already starting to come through. They peak in September. And by the time you get to the 1st of October, most of them have gone through. Um, but the, uh, if, if I were picking a day uh, in September, I would be sometime around the 15th. Um, they're not as uh, um, they're not as consistent in in fall as they are in spring. And actually, across the lake from us at Point Pelee in Ontario, that's another great spot. And there, it's uh, it's more consistent in fall. They uh, um, they they gather there on the north side of the lake and then think about it before they start flying south. Um, but but yeah, mid September I would say is is peak. Great, thank you. We had a comment from a participant that says that they thought they saw a Lincoln Sparrow yesterday in uh, Billy Frank Nisqually National Wildlife Refuge. And they looked at Iber to see if others had seen them around there this time of year. They've been reported in single numbers pretty much every month of the year, but a really good birder they know said it was unlikely. Do you have any comments? Okay, well, the, I know, um... You know, Lincoln sparrows do, um, they do spend the summer in, in the mountains um, out that way with, I'm, I'm not familiar with that, that refuge and exactly what would be there. Um, but one thing that, uh, that happens this time of year is that juvenile song sparrows can look a lot like Lincoln sparrows. The, uh, they can be very buffy on the chest and the, the stripes on the chest can be uh, very narrow. Uh, compared to the adult song sparrow, so uh, that's uh, that that's something I've been tripped up by uh, a number of times. 
uh, getting a glimpse of a juvenile song sparrow and then um, um, and getting a glimpse of a juvenile song sparrow and thinking at first it was a Lincoln's. But, you know, it's also possible that you saw Lincoln sparrows. So, uh, you know, don't, don't necessarily um, discount your own observation uh, just because of what someone else says. Yeah, she did mention here, um, I wonder if a lot of Oz sightings get put into iBird by amateur birders. And, you know, that goes back to um, your early days and referencing all the rare birds that you saw. <laughs> Yeah. Um, we had a question. Someone is curious if you have a favorite go-to field guide besides your own um, that's kind of a all-around helpful, easy go-to guide. Um, well, I, 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 th this is going to sound really terrible. I mean, please forgive me for this, but I, uh, I've, I've been, you know, studying bird ID for a long time, so I, I don't really use a field guide uh, if I'm in North America. Um, you know, if, if I see a bird and I can't identify it, then a, a basic field guide isn't going to help. But there's a, uh, uh, there are two volumes by Peter Pyle uh, called something like uh, Identification of North American Birds. I actually don't remember the title of the, the book, but it's two very thick volumes, a uh, black cover paperback by Peter Pyle, and it's uh, a reference that's used by bird banders because it has all this really detailed stuff about things that you can mainly see in the hand, um, about for telling different subspecies apart, for telling whether you like to say, uh, you know, a downy woodpecker is three years old or four years old, uh, just this really, really fine detail. So uh, if I'm going to a source on identification, um, that's, um, that's what I would go to for real uh, details. Um, but for, um, if I'm recommending an all around field guide, uh, something I'd suggest is that, you know, people just look at a whole series of books and think about some bird that you already know and look at the way it's represented in, in different books. and see which one you like best um, that way. And, um, you know, if, if you think of, um, uh, you know, if you think of a meadowlark as looking like this, then, you know, find, find the guide that fits your impressions the best. Yeah, I will, I'll piggyback on that and say that in, so the Friends of Mal here manage the Nature Store Refuge Headquarters, and we have a whole wall of field guides. And when someone asks me this question, I often take the time to, you know, pull down a Peterson, a Kaufman, a Sibley, the American Birding Association, and go through them w with that person to talk about their current comfort level, what they're, you know, ge generally drawn towards, whether it's color or shape or um, habitat information, um, and go through it that way. Um, and, you know, it's, it's not always for certain what someone's going to walk away, you know, with thinking that that's going to be their new backpack that book. Um, Okay, I think that um, that wraps up the questions. I have some information I want to share with everyone. This is not the end of our week. Um, we have several more events come happening through the next few days. So tonight there is a concert. St Stephen Nance is going to be performing a very birder piano concert, which I'm really excited about. I mentioned earlier it is interactive. So if you register in advance, I'm able to get that bingo sheet information out to you. Uh, tomorrow, Gary Ivey is going to be back talking about Sandhill Cranes. Um, tomorrow night, we are going to be the feature program for East Cascade Audubon Society's first virtual birders night. And Dan Streifer is going to be giving his presentation, Birding Mal Here and Beyond. Um, Friday, Ken is going to be back doing basic shorebird identification. And that night is Malheur Trivia. It's the fourth month in a row that we've hosted this online virtual trivia, and it's a lot of fun. So I hope um, you form a team and join us. And last but not least, all of this is um, an answer to having canceled our spring members weekend. And so we are holding an auction at the end of the week on Saturday at 7 p.m. A lot of great businesses have made donations to our auction. I'm really excited to be promoting local businesses like the Narrows RV um, Park and Cafe, 
uh, Steens Mountain Brewing, French Glen Hotel, Ord's Museum, uh, Kaufman. There is a full set of Kaufman field guides up for auction. Um, there are five books in this set, so that's pretty exciting. Um, and Wild Birds Unlimited, in addition to a local uh, or again, friends member and artist who has donated a piece of her art. So there's going to be a lot of really great stuff and I hope that you join us. Now these programs, here's some examples. There's the Kaufman Field Guide set and here's the Backyard Birders set from Wild Birds Unlimited. And you know, we are offering all of these programs all week long for free. And we hope that you find value in them and appreciate them. And if you are so inclined, we would love it if you'd make a donation of $10 per person per program or more. Um, and you can do that through our website. And I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now so that I can share the link with you to access more of the registration program links and also the donation form. So um, please uh, share with us in the chat box what you learned, what you appreciated, and maybe what other event you're looking forward to attending. I'm gonna get this link for us. Um, here is the donation link. Oh, this gotta send it to everyone. And let me get the website so that you can access the rest of the registration if you haven't signed up for some things that you're interested in attending. The registration links are embedded in the images on this page. So just scroll down the page, find the graphic for the program that you're interested in, or if it's a lecture that you're interested in, there's a specific text link available. So I really look forward to seeing a bunch of you back again at another presentation or a program. And thank you so much for being a part of our community and supporting Malheur National Wildlife Refuge through the Friends Group. We appreciate you. Thank you, Janelle. All right, thanks, Janelle. I really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. You guys are great. Cindy is interested in where she can learn more about molting. Molting yourself, Cindy, or bird molting? Sometimes I'd love to molt. <laughs> um, yeah, actually, um, there, there's a great book. Uh, it's written by Steve Howell, and it's one of the Peterson reference guides. Um, and, and it's just, I think the title is just like Molt. Um, but it, yeah, Stephen, Steve N.G. Howell, H-O-W-E-L-L. -L, uh, and it's a Peterson reference guide on Molt. And it's, it's really great because it, it describes um, the whole process in, in plain English. And it's got examples from every family and lots of photos and discussion. So I, I really recommend that highly. Thank you, Ken. Uh, someone asked where these presentations are going to be archived. Hopefully they're not gone yet. But I want everyone to know that the recordings are going to be edited and posted up as videos on our YouTube page and our Facebook page. And I'm going to have links to these in the upcoming September newsletter. So if you don't currently um, subscribe to our newsletter, head over to our website and sign up or shoot me an email. My email is just director at malherefriends.org and I will type that in the chat box. And our website is just malherefriends.org. We're a membership and donation-based nonprofit, and so we really value the opportunity to connect with and offer programs and events to our friends and followers. So thank you so much for your support, and we'll continue creating opportunities for you to connect with the refuge. And now, thanks for including a, a, a Florida boy here. Uh, when would be a good time to come out to Oregon to uh, visit Malheur? Oh boy, well, um, the worst time is probably in a pandemic, <laughs> but, but um, 
the best time to come to the refuge is in the spring. Um, we are really a, a spring migration refuge. Uh, winter is fun. It's not all that accessible for driving, especially if you're flying in and then getting a rental car. Um, it's not ideal. But um, and fall is beautiful, but we're not really that fall migration. So when people come here, they're expecting just blooms of birds. And that's going to be um, early to pretty much all through spring. But if you want to see the snow geese and Ross's geese, and you want to see the um, flocks of cranes that are migrating through, um, April is a really good month for that. We have our Harney County Migratory Bird Festival. Um, typically, it's the second weekend in April every year. We did cancel it this year, and we are talking about host having it again next year. Um, so that would be a really wonderful time to come because you get guided tours to you know find out where all the different species of owls are, or understand the Sylvie's floodplain, or take a whole loop around Steams Mountain and through the owl board and around. Um, so the, the bird festival is really wonderful, but we are talking about how that's going to look considering COVID. Um, smaller group sizes, maybe people are having to caravan or carpool rather than um, pulling people into vans and buses. Um, so we, we want to be able to offer the, the bird festival, but we want to keep our, our participants and our visitors and our communities safe. Any other questions? I should scroll back through and make sure I didn't miss anything. Um. Oh, um, Barbara, I don't know if she's still here. Yes, she is. Um, Barbara Taylor asked, um, she's always wondered if Ken ever earned his GED or college degree, or is his expertise solely based on self-education? Um, she's read Kingbird Highway. And I will say my friend Debbie, who is attending as well, she's touts around her tattered copy of Kingbird Highway. She loves that book. Mm. Um, yeah, well, um, uh, to, to that question, um, I never, um, I never went back to school. Um, I, I, I can't really say that I educated myself because for years I lived close to, you know, various universities or museums and I'd go take advantage of their science libraries and go to lectures and things. Uh, I do have, I do have a high school diploma, but it's an honorary one. Uh, I happened to be back in Wichita, Kansas, where I dropped out of high school. I'd, about one of one of my books had just been published, and I was there to do a, a, a big program at the Nature Center. And the superintendent of schools came out, and they presented me with this honorary high school diploma. So, for what it's worth, I've got that. <laughs> That's great. That's really great. Um, we could good, get well, Ohio State on the case, uh, Ken, and get you a, a proper degree from Ohio State. <laughs> well, they I would love that. to have that, but I don't know if I qualify. <laughs> you do absolutely qualify. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> awesome. Well, we've still got some people lingering. If anyone has any questions, um, I think I can speak for myself. Maybe Ken, we're willing to stick around for a few more minutes. Sure. Thank you everyone for your kind words and support. This is fantastic. Oh, Ken, are you a self-taught artist? Um, yeah, I, in terms of artwork, I, um, I guess, you know, I had sort of a basic class in well, it's sophomore year of high school, but I haven't had any any training before that. But I've been um, I've been sketching birds and drawing since I was like six or seven years old, and I started painting birds uh, in my early teens. And so I'm I'm still uh, I'm still learning. It's just um, you know it's, it's it's a long process. I I recently 
well, recently, about seven years ago, I switched over to using oils and it was like being a brand new beginner again. And I'm, I'm still struggling with that, but it's, you know, it's just so enjoyable. Um, awesome. Okay. All right. Well, I think we will sign off unless I see anything else pop up here in the next five seconds. Um, Oh, great, Mick. Safe travels. Marianne, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Thank you so much, Ken, for your time, and we'll see you back here on Friday. <laughs>